week. And this film, I created this film in 2010. Um, and, you know, the people responsible for this film festival were not Sarah Leone, but it premiered in Sarah Leone finally. But it made me wonder what kind of work can we do in addition to our hustle to promote ourselves as independent filmmakers, what kind of work can we do for our respective countries? Um, I think you have to, I think, look for partners in the country. Like, I think a lot of times, like, when we're thinking about how do we solve issues or different problems, we're kind of, we're thinking from, like, kind of like outside of the realm of it, but then when you're in the country, there are people who are creating things yeah. to solve you know, problems. And I mentioned earlier, there's an app called Afrinali, and it exists so you can watch trailers. It's supposed to be like the IMDb for African movies. So they just show trailers on there, and it's been downloaded by over a million people on the continent. So that's a resource for lots of people. You can partner with them, and there, there are different people in like the tech space that are trying to create solutions for film and beyond films. So I think it's really important to see what's happening on the continent, what are people doing locally, how are they accessing information, and then partnering with those people in those websites and, you know, being able to, you know, put things out there more effectively. Yeah, um, it's kind of similar. Uh, Broker TV, we actually do have a big network. We have a lot of users. So, from an independent filmmaker, it would actually make sense yeah. to kind of get materials on our sort of platform while we have a kind of global developing to that point organically where we offer that, that type of content is what we're still getting to. And most likely just a matter of time. The question is before you can get that, because you know, in theory it would be fantastic if um, you know, as an independent filmmaker you can walk into our office and say, I have this really good content, you can put it out, everyone can watch it. But at the same time, our responsibility is to our consumer and what their demand is for. So, you know, our, our platform and Happy Nolly's platform might be catering to a customer who's very Hollywood centric and he's coming on there because he really loves a specific type of movie on that platform. They might not be so interested in an independent content. And the question is how do we properly introduce that to a bigger network that can you know, tie into it and be engaged by it. And on one hand, it might be organic, uh, on other, it might, it might just be that you need a different way of kind of tackling that problem. Finding the finding the people within the kind of knowledge of others demographic that would be amenable to receiving this kind of content. And there's no you know, there's no solution. There's no way to figure it out right now, so to speak. But it's definitely why I think there should be some kind of third party involvement. Just creating a lower level of introduction out there before you kind of mass introduce it. Just speaking to like the responsibility and uh, what we're going through the problem, I think that it's in terms of, um, I think the problem might be in sort of the digital and distribution side, maybe in terms of getting people to see movies, which is a problem in any sort of <laughs> industry. But in terms of responsibility, like you were saying, I always felt that um, it's not, it's like, I know what it's like to be here and see movies over there and feel this disconnect, but I think that the way to do it is to go and make a movie, and they're not with partners or not through co-productions. There are, I mean, I don't know the situation Sierra Leone, but as me thinking of Ghana, there's enough production companies that can put out quality work that I could make a feature film entirely in Ghana, mm -hmm. and doing that and creating images and stories that are iconic, so that not only people who relate to it because they watched these stories growing up, but on a more universal level, see it, but see it as sort of a Ghanaian film as opposed to here's this co-production between this American company that they went to Ghana and made something. And I think also not underestimating the local market. I know like, I, like Nollywood is like so huge and, I, and obviously people think of African films, they're like, oh Nollywood, and maybe there's not an interest in other types of African films. But I, I just don't think that that's true. I think that people are interested in other types of films because I meet these people, I see them, and they are watching independent films. So I do think, you, again, you have to dig deeper. You know, like Francis said, you have to go, you know, to the country you're from or just 
go to African countries and just start to begin to have dialogues with people outside of, you know, just like you do here, outside of what's mainstream, you start having dialogues with other people, and then you find who's into what. You find out what different markets are available to you, because they're really on the air. So I think at this point we could open it out to questions from the audience. Yes. Well, um, having spent a lot of time on the African continent, many countries and here, and then I'm in the industry here, I think one big fault that I see with a lot of the filmmakers, and I'm so glad that we have so many filmmakers here, especially when people begin to do films within the indigenous language, let's say, of a particular area, that you really need, and especially you since you're a distributor, with, you need to set up some sort of uh, subtitling um, industry. That is an, an entire industry within itself. And it would so open up the audiences to African films. If you could buy a film that, that's in Yoruba, but they, it has English subtitling, or, or and I mean, and, and I mean South, South America or Spanish or whatever. But a whole subtitling industry would just, I think, blow up the entire African film industry to such a large extent. Because sometimes you see things, and it looks interesting, but you don't know what's really going on, and you you desperately want to know what's going on, and and you have that. So I mean, I think that that's something that filmmakers in general need to get on people like because I, I I like I get I get emails from your company, you know, every day I get emails, you know, click on a film, you know, and I <laughs> and I, I want to see and I want to know, you know. I think that's a very good, good point you were making, and that's something that I was thinking about in the, the prior uh, the question we were responding to. Um, one big issue is, is that I think that blocks a lot of the uh, accessibility to the films. Uh, and the continent is huge. There are literally thousands of languages being yeah. spoken, and we have you know more than 50 countries. Um, in, in light of that, we, we mentioned uh, Africa Film TV earlier that we have partnered with. They're based in Senegal, um, and uh, most of their content is I mean, they're, it's multilingual, but there's a lot of um, French in it because they cater to Senegal and the, the you know Senegalese diaspora, French-speaking diaspora. And we um, have been, you know, um, having, um, having adopted a, an African attitude towards our curation policy. Uh, but it's true that most of our content is in the English language. So when we don't have it uh, in the movie, we, we definitely don't select the movie if we don't have at least English or French subtitles. Yeah. Um, but we're also working on actually providing the service of dubbing and subtitling for those movies in, you know, um, dialects or other languages that are not as common. Because people want to come back for sure. But You've got to have it. You've got to have it. I, I mean, I know I, when I'm here in the U.S. and when someone wants something in a West African, I'm, I'm going to get that call. I know I'm going to get that call. You know, and so I'm laughing because there's, a, there's like a whole Reinhardt and Winston, they have a whole thing out on Nigeria. And the Nigerian you're hearing on there is me. And I'm not a Nigerian. But <laughs> but you know, you need that that part of the industry. It's, it's, it's vital. It's vital. I'd be interested to know what motivated you to be a filmmaker and individual. What are your missions? Why do you make films? I don't. He doesn't. I think I'm still
demographics. It's important for our own voices to tell our own stories. So for me at this point, it's a necessity because of just the tiny percentage of black women, women, black people, African people. I have multiple check lines. So um, at this point, I feel like not only am I in love with art form, but I have the opportunity to contribute to a dialogue that is very limited. Yeah, I mean, I definitely had, um, I think that when you're an African, you get that ghost up on Saturday, and you have the same beginning of like the representative thing, where I remember uh, hearing the video at Christmas time when I was little, and being like, it's not like that. The only water flows, the bears can tears, what? Um, and then, um, I've always been a storyteller, I've always been a writer, and I moved around a lot, so that whenever I try to tell stories and you write them in a language, it's like a very set amount of people that can access it, and it's always exciting to me because it's all about the inarticulable, and it's all about, you know, the moments that ever are universal, but, you know, can't be spoken or said, or uh, written, sorry. Yes? Um, you guys talked a bit about, like, how, uh, the, the digital era is affecting like, the form of the films you're making. Um, and one thing I find interesting is that there's also kind of a turn towards uh, Afrofuturism. And mm -hmm. Francis, you can probably speak to this particularly. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping you could just talk about that. Um, Afrofuturism. <laughs> well, Afrofuturism in relation to the digital era, but also in terms of like the di not just the different forms and kinds of films, but the different topics and subjects and things that are kind of suitable for digital distribution. Um, in terms of Afrofuturism, I guess what excites me about it is something that's a very small sect of it, which is that in this day and age, it's still shocking or iconic to see a black person in a future world. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so like the sort of like playfulness of that is exciting to me personally, and that's what Afronauts basically takes on. Uh, but in terms of forms changing, um, okay, I'm not going to run the ramp, so, but like in terms of, I don't see <laughs> Somebody else answer. I'll come back to me. You can say more about the future. Than <laughs> I don't like we should have a drink after. Can I just add to that? Because I mean, I really think it's it's very sort of ironic that you're saying that people would because just in terms of this country in NASA. There are so many people of color working at NASA. There are so many, I mean, there's been so many people of color that have gone into space and come back. And so, and I mean, need, need we say Neil deGrasse Tyson, I mean, you know, they, this is an area where people of color are deeply involved and participating in terms of the real world. So right, it shouldn't no, be unusual for us to see. It shouldn't, yeah, and that's why I'm talking out about the fact, because yes, there have been many people of color in space, and there are many people of color who are astronauts, but it's about the iconic and the myth of surrounding it. You know, it's, it's about the images almost. You know, and that like, when America landed on the moon, there were pixelated, there was pixelated video, but what do they have to do to make it iconic? They have to go into a photo studio. Yes, yes. And, and the images that we see have to be created in a photo mm -hmm. studio, and that's what I mean by, what excites me about <laughs> Afrofuturism, so, you know, it's about the yeah, the myth, the icon, and the image rather than the fact. Because mm -hmm. the fact that would be true um, doesn't matter to us in the same way as what we conceive of it. <laughs> I think also um, people are accustomed to seeing a certain type of African film. So when people see when something is Afrofuturism, people are like, wow. Kept the way it was shot, it was great, and I think it's it sits outside of the box of a perception of what African film is, and I think that contributes to like maybe some of like the excitement and awe around it by the person who's watching, who is not used to seeing an African film that's not a stereotypical African film. There was a lady in the back.
filmmakers around the continent. From the production side of it, I think we have really, really advanced. I've been watching African movies, Nigerian movies, from way back when they started. And I've seen the progression, the advancement that's been done now made in that area. And I'm really proud I stand here to perform. Something concerns me though, um, but before I go on to my concern, African films, especially in Hollywood, the films are seen in different places. I don't even have to tell you. My Indian friends, my friends from the diaspora, and all that, everybody's watching it. I am concerned about the economic side of it. It is a great endeavor that all of you are taking on. How do you break even and miss it? I hear you. How do we get the word out? Believe me, so many people from different corners, they know about Hollywood, but we're talking about independent films, right? But when you talk about independent films, is it French independent film or African independent film? They're going to be lumped all in one category, African film. They think Hollywood, Gallywood, and all that. I used to buy, I have a library of DVDs that I had purchased because it was illegal to you know, just get a cop made, as uh, Jim Ike would tell us. He was the warning. But people are still copying. But today, I don't even have to copy. I don't even have own DVDs anymore. Turn on my computer, on the Google, African movies. It is the third category on that, the menu. I click it, and I'm watching. I watch so many films. There are so many. And now here I am, I, I particularly came here to listen to you and meet all of you. Some of you are going to be out there. How do you, how are you going to make it economically, make it worth your while? It costs money to produce mm -hmm. of course. So how do you handle that? Knowing the proliferation of African movies on the internet and speaking. Yeah. I want to get it to film myself. Yeah. But I want to hear from you. How are we going to make the type of money that is being made in Hollywood? Thank you. I mean, I, that's, that's a great question. It's a good question. I think piracy is a huge issue for distributors and independent filmmakers. Um, I think speaking from a distribution platform, it just comes by offering the customer the best possible quality that, that you can offer. I think we, we have to fight a lot with the free content that's out there, the pirate content that's out there. We have to deal with a lot of legal issues from content that, you know, we really started the kind of legal process of acquiring rights, digital rights and content. We've had to establish that with the FBI as hell and the agencies around the world to really implement that, you know, when a filmmaker sells his content, he should get he should get remuneration or he should get paid basically when that content is be distributed at different points. Um, it's very hard, it's very important to us as distributors, the filmmakers are rewarded. because um, that makes them want to come back. And you know, if we can deliver their content with the highest quality to the customer, eventually the customer will prefer that over the less quality pirated content. So similar if you take Hollywood content, you know, Netflix does better than YouTube movies because they offer an ad that free service that streams very well on multiple devices in different locations. And you know, if we can really just focus on <coughs> marketing the best. Um, I think economically you start to take start to take care of yourself 
And we've managed to be very successful by really sharpening the quality of the content going in, going into the producers directly and working with them to improve that. And also telling them, look, you when you make something, don't just go to the marketplace and sell it and then forget about it and that's it. Because they'll make a very small amount of money. The <coughs> producer will come out with like thirty thousand uh, dollars a year from making a movie that will sell like two hundred thousand copies. So you know, it, it comes to the producer level. They have to be mindful of what their worth is, what their content is worth. Mm -hmm. And once they are, platforms like ours really help in the economic side of things, like to bring legal content to customers and to really make sure the quality is as high as we can make it and improve it as time goes by.